Hello everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maludimim in Israel. Everybody wants to know the future. This is probably one of the longest standing desires of human beings. It is hard to imagine even primitive cave dwellers not wanting to know what lay in wait for them in the future. We don't know if any of the higher intelligence animals share this goal, but it seems pretty universal amongst our species. It may even be a defining feature of the human mind. Most of us have no great longing for knowledge of the past, which is partially available for anyone who wants it and only of limited value to those who do. But the future is forever waiting for us, like a carrot on a stick that is attached to the forehead. It hovers there almost within reach, but nevertheless always beyond our grasp. In some ways, it seems like a form of divine torture, perpetually tantalizing us with its forbidden fruit. People pay considerable sums of money to get a glimpse of what they believe to be the future. We all imagine how much easier and dependable our lives would be if we just had a more secure handle on what's coming down the pipeline. If only we had some crystal ball that could tell us the important things, the things that we really need to know, we would be that much ahead of the game. Of course, we don't want to know everything. That would spoil much of the fun in life. We don't want to know who is going to win the ball game or what great surprises are in store for us. But getting a few previews of the future whets the appetite like watching a trailer for a movie. It is a bit odd that God made things this way, that the future would forever be unknowable. Why couldn't God simply have made things so that we could know it somehow, if only to satisfy our curiosity? But if that were the case, it really wouldn't be the future at all. It would be like the end of a movie that we've already seen, but are in the middle of at the moment. It would simply have to be played out, but is really already there and known. It seems that there has to be this major component of our lives that is never quite real, but is always waiting for us. We have to act on it as if it is real, while fully knowing that it isn't. This week's Parsha is called Kitetse. That two-word phrase means, when you go. An introduction to a verse about going to war. While this may seem like an odd opening to a Parsha, it is by no means a theme the Parsha revolves around. In fact, there is no such theme for this Parsha. It is simply a long series of commandments in no apparent sequence. They go from marrying captive female prisoners to returning lost objects to rape and accusations of adultery, to various forbidden marriages, to divorce, to keeping honest weights and measures. There are in total around 74 separate commandments, depending on how one counts them. They wander so aimlessly with no obvious pattern that it almost seems like a large group of people were shouting them out and one guy was writing them down as he heard them. This is the third of three Parshas that make up the middle portion of the book of Deuteronomy. All three of these middle parshas consist of lists of commandments. This one has by far the most. While the others have general themes and patterns, this one seems to just wrap up all those that didn't fit into the first two into a collection of miscellaneous rules. Deep in the middle of it is one about shooing away the mother bird from a nest before taking the eggs. Right near that are others dealing with forbidden mixtures of crops and textile materials. In between those, we find what find one about putting a guardrail around the roof of one's house. Towards the end, there is one requiring a man to marry his dead and childless brother's widow to carry on the name of the deceased. But near the beginning of this long list, there is one that seems the most bizarre of all. It is not that it is weird like those forbidden mixtures in clothing, or possibly objectionable like marrying a brother's widow. It is every bit as rational as the laws about rape, or adultery, at least by biblical standards. But when we hear it, we cannot help but wonder what those standards could possibly have been if something like this came out of them. Here it is in all its glory. Quote, When a man has a wayward and rebellious son who doesn't listen to his father or his mother, and they punish him and he still doesn't listen to them, his father and mother shall grab him and take him to the elders of the city at the main gates. They shall say to the elders of the city, Our son is wayward and rebellious. He doesn't listen to us, being a glutton and drunk. All the men of the city shall pelt him with stones until he dies, and you shall remove the evil from amongst you, and all of Israel shall hear and fear. It is hard to believe that something like this is found in the Bible. 
Then again, there's quite a lot of fire and brimstone in the Bible, so perhaps this doesn't seem all that far out of line. Then again, most of that fire and brimstone comes from God, in which case it is perhaps excusable. This, however, is something that regular people must do. They must stone this rebellious son to death for whatever it is that he has done. This does sound like something one might hear rumors of in Afghanistan in the worst case scenarios. What is it doing here? What did this kid do that was so terrible to begin with? Well, he was wayward and rebellious, which sounds pretty bad right off the bat. He's not much for listening to his parents, another point against him. On top of that, he was a glutton and a drunkard. Capital crimes, if there ever were any. For that, he must be put to death in this incredibly brutal manner. There are many people who look to the Bible as their primary source of spiritual guidance who might secretly prefer if things like this could somehow be edited out of the text. Those people are not without authoritative precedent. Rabbis of the Talmud about 1700 years ago declared that this particular fate was never actually handed out to anyone. Though there is a contrary opinion there, this has become the view of choice among Jews through the centuries, that this commandment was never actually carried out. It was obvious to those Talmudic rabbis that this was just going too far, and that the Bible never really meant this to be anything other than a rather blatant and harsh example of where things could lead if they got out of hand. Despite this apparent mitigation of what sounds like severe overkill, the Talmud also presents a kind of justification for the law as it is in the Bible. They say that the so-called rebellious son is killed because of what he will do in the future. There are very specific conditions listed in the Talmud for what qualifies as a genuine rebellious son, including a rather narrow window of age right around 13, and what he, what he must do in his actual rebellion. There is a certain amount of stealing to satisfy his gluttony, which doesn't bode well for his future. In other words, the Talmudic rabbis saw this as the biblical example of irredeemable juvenile delinquency. Because of this, they saw that the only way to avert the inevitable gloomy future that was in store for this youth was to put him out of his misery before he could fulfill his evil destiny. This appraisal of the situation brings all kinds of problems to the fore. There are issues of free will that are raised. Why can't this unfortunate child choose his own destiny and overcome whatever tendency he has displayed up to this point in his life? There are issues of justice that arise. How is this truly fair to kill a person this young for something that he hasn't yet done but is assumed to do in the future? Why is it that a few relatively harmless actions as a youth condemn him to this evil destiny? How did anybody ever imagine that such a fate could be locked in from such scant evidence? There are no obvious answers to any of these questions. Rather than seek answers, perhaps we should simply try to understand what the Talmudic view of this situation really was. They were trying to justify an obviously harsh commandment in the Torah. The method they used was to hinge everything on the future. What this young man had done up till now locked his future into place to some degree. Free will notwithstanding, his future was severely limited by what he had done in the past. While it may seem outrageously unfair to us to condemn him to death for what he had not yet done, this, at least theoretical possibility, had to be taken as a possible course. Aside from all the clear difficulties we have already brought up with this commandment, the, this rabbinic take on things may possibly shed some light on that most mysterious of times in our lives, the future. While we may disagree with this harsh take on the destiny of the rebellious son, we very likely recognize that there is an element of truth in the general idea. The future, in a sense, is already here. There may be a good deal of leeway in precisely what is going to happen, but there is also a good deal that is already locked in. We all know this to one degree or another. While we may intuitively believe that we have the power to change anything we wish, and that the future is always within our ability to determine, we can never be 100% sure that that is indeed the case. We do have a version of a crystal ball. It's that inner sense, optimistic and sometimes not so optimistic, that we just know what's going to happen. Why we have this crystal ball is a bit of a mystery. It may be an intuitive power of the mind, 
It may be something about reality that gives us a hazy feeling of certainty concerning the future. It may be that the future, in some inexplicable way, is as real as the present or the past. While this may make no sense to the rational way we are used to thinking, perhaps things like this rebellious son situation are suggesting that there may be other way of thinking about things like this. Perhaps the ultimate message out of all this is that we do forge our future to some extent with each step of our lives. Whether we like it or not, to a great degree, we set ourselves on what becomes that inevitable course. The future may not be permanently forged in the present, but it is certainly steered by the present. If all we really get out of the rebellious sun is that what we do know now will have an indelible effect on our future, then this commandment has served its purpose. It is a warning of sorts, telling us that we, more than anyone else, set the course for our own future. Shabbat Shalom.